What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode podcast interview. Every single week, I interview top real estate professionals, top entrepreneurs, and straight up top badasses that are out there dominating their space. And today, guys, we got two epic guests back on the podcast, return uh, a podcast guests, Ryan Kelly and David Casey, just to give some quick backstory before we jump in. So they are the founders of First Class Real Estate Casey Brokerage. They teamed up back in 2019, just the two of them with a goal of starting their team and doing 100 transactions in 2020, which they hit. Then they decided to go out there and start their own brokerage in late 2020 and went from 33 million in annual production to uh, last year over 102 million in annual production or did that in a 12 month span of time, that growth. Um, they now have projected sales volume this year of 320, or 320 million. They've in addition to starting the real estate brokerage, well, they've also opened a second office now that we'll get into, um, mm -hmm. but they also have their own mortgage company that they started plus insurance. They're recognized as one of the fastest growing companies in Kansas City. Now, about a year ago, I had them all here on the podcast. And at that time, there were about 60 agents. Now they're roughly 135 plus agents. So growing, kicking ass and doing some epic things. So really stoked and honored to have back on the podcast, Ryan, David, welcome back, fellas. Yeah, uh -huh. thanks, Josh, for having us. Yeah, I really appreciate, appreciate it. it, man. Always love chopping it up with you. Uh, you're an inspiration to us, so I'm um, happy to share some of the lessons we've learned from you and what we've learned along the way, too. Yeah, no, I'm stoked for this, man. Because, yeah, I mean, it, I was just looking at, okay, like, right before we jumped on here, I was looking at the date of our last podcast, which was almost about exactly a year ago. Um, and, and I mean, we're going to get into a lot of things here. Um, you know, but again, I mean, to go out there and what's that, 75 agents or, or roughly that you've been recruited in the last 12 months? That's about right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bringing on about nine to 12 a month. Yeah. At our current pace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all. So all those things I, I want to jump into, man. Um, you know, but before we do that, man, I mean, let's 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 talk about I know we covered this in our last podcast, but a lot that maybe tuned in this one didn't hear this. So we'll go kind of quickly with this. But just to kind of recap. You know, um, because there, there's a lot of, I mean, I have a lot of conversations, um, about 80% of my coaching clients are team leaders or broker owners and, and, you know, big percentage of podcast listeners are as well, or, or they have maybe they're individual agents right now, but they have the aspiration of growing a team and then eventually maybe a brokerage, you know? Um, but a question I get all the time is, well, man, should I start my own brokerage? You know, cause you guys had started your team, started kicking ass out of the gate with your team, then very quickly decided to transition into the brokerage where I believe that you kind of have a team component of that too. But, yeah. um, uh, you know, what, what led to that decision of, instead of going like, I don't know, instead of going just the continued path of, of keeping growing the team that mm -hmm. early on, like what led you to that decision of boom, let's pivot to this brokerage thing. Yeah. I, I can lead that one off for us. You know, it, it was, we were at kind of a fork in the road. Um, we were with the real estate coach and we've learned now looking back, and, you know, some of his words of advice were, um, if you guys want to want to save more money and make a lot of money in this industry, you should own your own brokerage. That was kind of the the little tips he gave us, you know, little nuggets to, to think about. He didn't really tell us to go one way or another. He just said, this is this is my thoughts on it. Um, and then, you know, we both after we ended the call, we're like, that's what we're doing. You know, um, cause I think it's important to, when you have people in your life that you're shadowing under or that are mentors of you that are in a position where you want to be, um, like let's say five years, 10 years from now, and they give you that kind of advice, I, you shouldn't necessarily hesitate on that. You should act pretty promptly. So we did. And, uh, we were going to like, I think we just kept running into ourselves every time we kept setting new goals for the next quarter as being a team. And Ryan can attest to this too, because we were just running with our hair on fire, closing about 20 deals a month, just me and him. Um, and we just said, okay, is next year's goal to double this? <laughs> yeah. You know, I think we had the conversation about the hamster wheel too. And oh, it's just like, it's like you can never get off it. So we knew we needed to scale. Um, and we wanted to grow and we didn't want to keep being the person opening the door, showing houses. I mean, I remember you saying a long time ago, Josh, you said, after you see a closet 700 times in a year, it doesn't. It's like, I can't get excited about a closet on the, you know, 701st time, you know, that year. And so you got to, you know, at least for us, we said, okay, well, let's explore this path. Um, and, and, you know, from there, it's just, everything's changed. It's just been wild. Yeah. And I'm glad we made that decision. Just looking back at the scalability and the retention of teams, um, they expect a lot more from you, in my opinion, than the brokerage level. Um, keeping everybody happy, growing and expanding under a brokerage that has splits and all the other things 
tied to it. You can't really go out and build your own thing how you want it to. And, you know, like I said, retention after owning our brokerage, it's, it's almost a hundred percent. I think we've lost 15 agents and of those 15 four produced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, um, something there too, where it's, you know, Ryan was talking about like, uh, the retention, the scalability and, and whenever you're looking at growing a team under a brokerage, like <laughs> whenever we were cooking, we had about, I don't know, 20 listings live. We had about, uh, 25 deals in escrow. Um, we told our broker, we wanted to expand and open our own brokerage. We said, Hey man, you know, this was our coach. We had a conversation with our coach. We respect you as a, as an owner, as an independent broker. Um, we don't really know where to go with this information. We're kind of intimidated about opening an office. It just sounds so daunting. Never thought about it. Could we open a branch under your name, like under your company name? You know, let's, let's expand this because we have bigger aspirations. And he sat us down and he said, um, I will not do that. And he encouraged us to stay exactly where we're at and just kind of stay put and keep producing. Well, we kind of, you know, he saw our demeanor in that conversation and I think he saw the writing on the wall because I already passed my broker exam and, you know, we were kind of checked out when he told us no. The very next day, we got a letter from his attorney, um, a cease and desist. And he said, you're no longer allowed on our premise. I've released your license back to the state. I'm retaining all of your listings and any deals that are under contract, we'll pay you out on those, but we're going to charge you a, an extra fee per closing. And he, he kind of shafted us out of, I'd say, probably close to $80,000 in commission. Best and, thing that ever happened to us. And <laughs> honestly, like when we got that text, you know, me and him, because we knew we wanted to open our own brokerage, we were probably expecting about 175000 in gross commission that month. And, and we saw all of that just go away. Like in our heads, we're just like, this just evaporated because one person could just pull the plug on us. And he was well within his rights to do that because there, we, we, we gave up so much control of being under a brokerage like that. And so light bulb went off. We said, you know what? Things don't happen to us. They happen, you know, for us. Um, we're going to turn around and we're going to make sure he regrets it. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, one thing that we were able to do too, is we told our agents, Hey, you get a pay raise, no more 25% commission because as you know, the agent retention and how many deals that the typical agent does, you're paying out splits, double splits to the brokerage plus to your team. I mean, even if it's an $8,000 cap, like that $8,000 to them is their first, you know, six, seven deals. Well, how many eight deals does an agent do? And if you're taking 50, 50 plus they're getting a 20, 25% split off the top, like it's just impossible to grow under and really scale. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What, 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 a, what a asshole move, dude. What a prick. But like you guys mentioned, man, uh, you know, you, you use it to be fuel of that fire and I'm mm -hmm. guessing that, that that's uh, uh, probably still a lot of good fuel of the fire to go out there and just oh, yeah. crush them. Josh, and, guess what our first metric was we wanted to shoot for it when we opened our brokerage? Be, beating their agent count. Oh yeah, absolutely. We said, how fast can we get to 40 agents? Cause at first we thought 40 was a lot. We're like, dude, that's a, that's a huge number. And um, we got to 25 agents within six months. And then right after that, we quickly hit 50, uh, 40. And we're like, dude, we're the same size. Like, what? This is kind of crazy. And then we been just, open 25 plus years. And we started recruiting as agents too. We're like, you know what? Yeah, we're, we're, fuck, we're really going to. you. It's on, dude. Uh -huh. yeah, I, I do the same, dude, man. You, you want to declare war, it's war, bro. Um, Yeah. yeah. And it, we hear, dude, like I, I just, you know, had a, uh, I don't know when this will be released exactly the date, but you know, about a month or so ago, I had on John Wentworth. Um you know, who, who was the number one team leader in the state of Michigan. And he wow. started his own title company. Well, mm -hmm. it so happened that his brokerage owner had their own title company. And when his broker owner found that out, he walks in the office and he's like, dude, you're same thing. Like overnight, like no warning, just you're out, you're done. Yep. Get your shit. You can't step foot in here, you know? Um, and then, you know, end up turning into a blessing. I, but for a lot, like do going through that pain, and, and mm -hmm. this is where I'm always telling people, like, you got like, you got to make sure you're, you're not vulnerable, man. Um, mm -hmm. I hear these horror stories all the time. It doesn't matter who we're with. If you don't own your own, you know, like hopefully your, your, your owner operator that you're hanging your license at is a mature human being and understands those impacts to your business. But you have a lot of immature fucking douchebags, like your ex broker owner, that's going to pull moves like that, that could just uh -huh. crush people. It's kind of like growing up under the wrong uh, family and then you just learn exactly what not to do. Well, that's yeah. what we did with the brokerage level too. Yeah, we, we made a vow. We're like never treating anybody like that again. If you don't want to be here, 
leave. If you want to come back, we'll welcome you back with open arms. That was always my experience when I was licensed in Arizona. I bounced around between a couple of brokerages. It was hugs in and out. No big deal. Um, and that's where we are. And, and, you know, we always have this saying too, it's people over pennies. Like I will lose money to save a relationship because at the end of the day, I know that money is such a, 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 a pinch point you know, a pain point for, for most people. And, and, you know, somebody who's a little tight on cash and new in the business, man, will, will go to very, you know, far lengths to try to keep a little bit of money that they feel they're owed. And for us to be blessed in our position where we've grown and scaled so, so large, so quickly, we can count on our residual income that dude, I'll take a loss up front to save a relationship because I know reciprocity and just treating people with fairness in the right way will come back tenfold. And, you know, that's just really driven our core values and how we operate here. Yeah. So th this wasn't like, a, I mean, this was a forced, you know, forced thing. Now, now, Definitely. yeah, you could have just went and grown your team under another umbrella, but you sure. already knew that that's what you wanted. Mm -hmm. So at that point, did you guys immediately jump into the, the franchise that you're with right now, or did you go indie for a while and then make that decision? Yeah. So in the beginning, me and David talked and you know, how, how our coach that was at Tom Ferry at the time and how he ran things was very tight knit, uh, seal team type atmosphere, independent broker. That's the route we were going to go until we found out, you know, it seemed like a daunting task to come up with just even the branding or what are we going to call this thing mm -hmm. or how are we going to open it? What all is necessary? Um, you know, onboarding, offboarding systems, accounting, marketing, everything seemed like, you know, it was just too hard to get over. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm always implementing things and I'm always looking out for the next sale at the time and all that other stuff. So it was all left on David's back and I I'm the I'm systems guy. And, you know, I just saw this, like Ryan, he kind of, he kind of sucks at tests. He hates them. So I'm the one that gets my broker's license, like just kind of understanding our personalities and, and how we best operate kind of dictated which role we took. So I became the broker. I got licensed, Ryan, you know, then we co-owned this thing together, but man, like, when we were making this decision of going this route with the franchise, I wanted to something to plug and play. And, you know, a principle that we learned looking back and that we stepped into early on, fortunately enough, was I want to win twice. And, and so it's like a win-win scenario means like I win, Josh wins. But in this scenario, it's how can I win twice in business? And so by opening your own company and having control, dude, I'm going to get paid to build it. And then at a future date, whenever I'm ready to, to go in a different direction, I'm going to get paid again to sell it. And so there, there we go twice. But if we kept under a different brokerage where we had, we didn't have that control, how are you going to sell your team? You know, or, or how are you going to, um, you're constantly going to be in the work of it. And then what if somebody pulls something where they, they sell the company? Like we just had a major acquisition happen with a flat fee company here in Kansas city. They sold to another one, you know, so what happens there? There's some disrupt that happens. And if you don't own that, that, um, that company, the business, you, you know, you're just, you're really setting yourself up for failure. So we wanted to be in a position to win twice. And, you know, I watched this show, um, called, uh, what was it? It was, um, was it undercover billionaire? I think it was with Grant Cardone. He did a, he did one. Um, but man, his first move, you saw like three entrepreneurs go at it. It might've been four of them. Uh, three out of the four, let's just say, I can't remember how many there were. So we'll call it three out of four. They all went and started something from scratch. I'm going to start my own juice company. I'm going to start my own, um, my own like bakery or this or that, like literally starting from ground zero. What did Grant Cardone do? He went around and partnered with someone. He went to the gym owner and said, Hey, I can grow your revenue and anything over what you're at now. I want a piece of it. Let's call it 10%. And then he said, okay, I'm going to do something else. And, and he built a couple different businesses by partnering mattress company and then the, uh, the gym. And so everybody got evaluated at the end of the 90 days, you know, sure. You know, I think for just the value of the show and they didn't want to make people feel bad. The three other people, they got million dollar valuations or pretty close to it, or maybe a little bit more. Grant Cardone had almost a $4 million evaluation. And I feel that was a true evaluation because he partnered, he skipped steps. He didn't have to go create a brand name, do this or that. It's like understanding what our goals are in real estate. Like it's, you know, at each stage where we're at, whether it's, you know, we're individual agents producing, we're team leaders, um, or we're rolling into opening our brokerage. Like we just want to figure out what like small hinges move big doors. 
So how can we just plug into something that just swings that big door? And I don't have to think about a logo. Too many conversations I have with team leaders and we talk about, you know, this whole play of like, hey, open an office, do what we did. They're like, I don't like the logo. I'm like, a logo is going to stop you from that. Like, like, let's just think about it logically. Are you trying to like, is the most important component of your business a logo? You would, if you told me yes, then I would think your business is probably in trouble. Now, is there something to be said about like, you know, um, how, how it looks, you know, like outward to the public and stuff like that image branding. I totally understand that. There's other ways around that. But I think if, you know, your only pain point is just like, um, you know, from the outside looking in of, of that, I think you're just looking at it for the wrong reasons and not what you could build, like, you know, how we've done it over the past 24 months and grown it into something like this. Yeah. And I think the uh, independent brokerage versus the franchise model too, is I always like to look at someone who's done it at the most successful level. And in our area, the most successful independent franchise had 36 agents, and uh, it was actually our, our old office. And uh, they had been like that for the last 25 years. You go look at the most successful offices and they were franchises. So yeah. all of them were. Yeah. Independent brokers get smoked by franchises. Yeah. Um, I mean, you guys bring up uh, such a great point of, you know, the, the like the undercover boss story. I mean, because if you think about it, I mean, that's what we do here in real estate. Like, okay, it's yeah. not like, okay, we're selling somebody else's product, like meaning as an agent, you know, yeah. right? Like think of the amount of time it would take to have to go out there and figure out and get the funding to go out there and, you know, buy the dirt, build your own property, then sell that and then go to the next. And it's like, no, we're selling somebody else's product, yeah. you know, um, and being able to slide in and, and yeah, I mean, it, being able to plug into a proven system, dude, there's something for that. Yeah. We could try to go out there and reinvent the wheel, but I'm all about R&D, rip off and duplicate. And exactly. you know, there's a, a, a small business association stat um, out there that tracks this stuff very heavily, you know, but it's something like 90% of franchises succeed, but 80% of, of indie businesses fail within the first five years, you know, and mm-hmm. there's a reason for that, man. It, it's like the example I always use is, you know, okay, you want to go out there and, and start a sandwich shop. Okay, you got two options. Like you can go, well, you, well, you got multiple options, but you know, yeah. like here is an example. Okay, you can go out there and try to figure this out, plop your own <laughs> yeah. location, figure out the recipes, figure all this out, or you can just go buy a fucking Jimmy John's and you're pretty much guaranteed to succeed. Yeah, you're gonna have right. to work, you got to put in the work. It doesn't mean that that's gonna be without work, but it's like they have such a proven model where you're gonna you do this, plop your location here, here's the recipes, here's who you hire, here's the POS system. You just gotta, you just gotta follow the playbook. And if you do so, you're gonna make this much revenue per location. Yeah, and I'm I'm sure franchises are similar to ours, but there's all these franchisees at different levels in the business. So th- when we first started, there was a few people that we talked to because we wanted to get to their level. But there's always another level inside of that uh, franchise to go and track after, get on phone calls with, figure out what they're doing right, what the others are doing right and try to make your model grow to that so yeah like the um it's a mastermind principle i mean you just get around those people that are there and you know something that's really like guided us along the way is dude i i look at people and i say um in this stage of my life where i'm at the path i'm on if it's just being a an individual top producing agent or a team leader like for us it was in the moment of it being a team leader i said okay let me look at the most successful team leaders in my town would I trade places with them? In five years from now, I keep working. You know, we're going to go however many months that is, 60 something months, whatever it is. Do I, would I want to be in their exact spot? And do I want to trade places with them? How do they treat their spouse? How are their conversations at home? How's their quality of life? Like, would I completely swap? And if the answer is no, then you need to abandon whatever you're in right now and look for an alternate path or a different way to do things. Like, that's what helped me get out of the military. Yep. That's to help Ryan quit the Ford plant. He saw, you know, people that have been there forever, top pay. And he's like, I don't know if I want to be there in 10 years. Same no with way. me in the military. You know, what point were you going to make? Yeah. So I was just talking about, look at the individual agent. That was one thing David and I brought up that one August evening. We were like 12 o'clock at night, having friends over at David's house. We were jamming out on the computer, negotiating deals, calling listing agents, doing the whole nine yards we had 23 transactions under contract and closing out that august and we were thinking okay is our goal to hit 30 next month is that our goal like next year do we want to do this every single month and we're like no it's just you you trade money for time and instead we 
we've been able to grow to where we can trade time for money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, I mean, I see a, a, a lot of brokerage owners or team leaders, you know, but um, <clears throat> we'll just stick with brokerage owners. Cause that's, you know, where you guys are at at this point. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, that end up staying small. And when I say small, I'm going to say, I'm going to classify that as 50 agents or less, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, and it just seems like most stay there. And, and that didn't mean people might hear 50 agents. That's a lot, but okay. Your bank account, those margins, unless you're running a boutique where it's, it's, you know, high margin, like a team, but a lot of yeah. exposure, you know, I mean, more like, it, it, you know, it, 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 they're very thin, you know, it, like right. it, it comes around an agent count, yep. you know, um, but what has been different for you guys, you know, from like a mindset perspective, you know, cause that's where I believe that all this begins, you yeah. know, uh, uh, you know, what, what's that difference from, you know, those other broker owners that may be stuck at 10 agents or like your last broker owner that was at 35 agents for the last 25 years. Like what's that what's that shift? What's that difference of operation style that allows yeah. you guys to scale so fast? You know, honestly, um, our old broker sold a hundred houses a year. Um, didn't have a ton of time for people in the office and that wasn't his, um, metric that he was following. So I think KPIs for us, whenever we looked at the brokerage model, it wasn't how many deals can we do, but it's how many agents can we getting can we get in to do the most amount of deals that they can do? Mm -hmm. So I think our, our KPIs were different. Our metrics were different. And that's allowed us to scale and grow was when we got out of production. Yeah. I mean, cause you, you focus on like as an agent convos, appointments, contracts, right? You're, you're uh, tracking those three things every day. And then when you're an effective team leader or even like a branch manager at a brokerage, it should be agent count, each month, how many new agents are bringing on? And then how many contracts are those agents putting under? Yep. And so we made that our focus where I think a lot of other people, they get distracted. They kind of get settled in. Um, and, you know, since we have this ecosystem we're a part of, man, we see other players in it, like in the, you know, franchise model, pushing, bringing on 12 agents, 15 agents. Shoot, there was um, some people bringing on 20 agents a month. And we said, how, how are we settling for three a month? Right. So yep. the ecosystem drove us and, and like, dude, we can run fearlessly because we know we have support. Like when you're isolated on an Island as a broker owner, um, man, it's like, it, you're so scared to make that next step because you don't know what's behind that wall or, you know, behind that door. And for us, I can literally just phone a guy from Alabama and say, Hey, Phil, what's behind this door. And he'll say, Oh, this, this, and that, this is what I do. This is what I say. Here's the things you're going to run into. Here's my systems. Good luck. And then we just go boldly into that next step. And dude, that just allows us to keep growing. So we just find out when are we getting comfortable? When are we kind of sitting around like twiddling our thumbs? And then we just get on the whiteboard and start jamming out. Like what are some one and dones we can knock out that can take us to the next level? And that's, we just do that on a regular basis. And it's, it, it's because of the ecosystem. So I think it's who you surround yourself with is will dictate where you go. And I think a lot of broker owners, team leaders and agents just get a little comfortable. And I've always said comfort is the enemy of success. That's always like, I've always had that thought in my head since I was young. And I just noticed when I start feeling a little too comfortable, I get a little uneasy, you know? Yeah. 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 And speaking about the last time that we had talked, we were in that comfortable stage. We had one office, we had 65 agents, mm -hmm. our profits were doing great. Um, I mean, our expenses were low, everything was going awesome. We had a conversation with our mentor at the time. He's, I know you're good friends with him, but Ryan Finch, he said, uh, you know, when you get in this sort of comfort level, the best thing that you can do, especially while your profits are high, go jump off the deep end inside the pool. You've got, you've got your finances from this already stacked up. Now's your opportunity to really go grow. Mm -hmm. And so we took that and we opened up our second office. But what you just said earlier really made me think of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah Don't said, get comfortable. He says, uh, you, you, you have to win in order to lose. And it was like a flip because I'm like, no, you have to, you have to lose in order to win. He's like, no, no, no. Once you're winning, now go bet on yourself and try to lose. Go do something crazy you know, like grow another office, put yourself in that position, you know, pressure creates diamonds. Dude, once we did that, this was like one of the best decisions we made, you know? So like exactly what Ryan said, it's, you gotta, you gotta win to lose in these scenarios. Yeah. And then in taking it a step higher than what you guys just talked about, you know, when it comes to just mindset philosophies, 
and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but you know, I've known you guys for a little while now, several yeah. years, and just from observation or conversations, you know, even at a deeper layer than than what we just discussed, you know, um, I, I think that what's driven this success is is operating off of that philosophy of hey, we are here to build a business, not right. a job, but a business. And this goes back to that conversation that you were just talking about, Ryan, where you were like, okay, we're sitting here jamming, you know, doing this month in close out to pop 20 deals. And what are the goals next month to get to 30? Like, is this really what we want? Like, yeah. no, let's go out there and grow a true a true business that has the right leverage components, you know, then that we can go big with this thing. Yeah. Thousand Man, our, our, yeah, our mindset is like, we just like, you don't have to be closing 20 deals a month in order to make decision to open an office. Like, I mean, we have good friends and at different companies that are scaling enormously that you ask them, they only sold 27 deals their entire life. Like, I did 27 deals. I know I'm entrepreneurial. I have a bigger vision. I'm going to grow a massive team and expand. Like, and now they're freaking lights out or whatever they're doing. So a lot of it comes down to like, where's your, what's your threshold? Like, what's your thermostat set on? Um, and so like, if your thermostat set on, like, I just need to make 10 grand a month and I'm cool. Well, then that's all you're probably going to get for a really long time until something catastrophic happens where you say, I need to wake up, you know, whereas like highly successful people, you know, Josh, we told you, you know, Hey, you only got 10 grand to live off or whatever. You'd probably be like, like, that's not even, I can't even fathom that because I know I can earn X doing this. And so it's like, when you just kind of put yourself in that mindset of this is my threshold. For us, like, you know, we, we had a conversation, we fly all of our top agents out to, we call it our president's club trip. We went to Jamaica this past year and we were talking to another franchise that had been around for a while, um, or at least been with the company for a while longer than us. And they said, man, we're, um, I, you know, we were complaining. We're like, man, we're only bringing on like five agents this month. Or like, I, like, you know, we're really trying to figure out what's wrong. And he's like, five agents, I'd be stoked. He's like, what? I'd be, I'm like, nah, dude, we should be hitting like 15, 20. Like we, I think we offer the best thing in town. Like, and so my thermostat is like, we need to be hitting double digits. His is like, I would be grateful for five. So yeah. I think, you know, that might've been a little eye opening for him, at least hearing my discomfort at a level that he thinks is unachievable. So like, it, like, I'm glad I was able to give him that perspective. And then now I need to figure out who can I get around that's telling me I'm playing too small. Right. And so those are the things we look for on a continue and uh, continual basis. Yeah. Love it. All right, so let's let's transition into agent recruiting because um, you guys are doing a lot of it. Yeah. Um, and and it is you know a, a, a something that so many team leaders, so many broker owners struggle with. And when it mm -hmm. comes to agent recruiting, you know, mm -hmm. if there's individual agents listening to this, you know, I don't want you guys to think you can't get value of it because at the end of the day, it's all recruiting. You're recruiting buyers, sellers, agents, yeah. or your leadership team to do those things for you. It's really all yeah. this process. Mm -hmm. But you know, what what are you guys doing? Can you, if you can walk us through. You know, from strategy to, to what that process is to grow. I mean, because I mean, that's essentially what 75 plus you probably lost some. So it's probably more than 75 agents in the last, you know, since our last conversation. Yeah. Yeah. We have, we have some agents go to referral status. Um, you know, some agents that they ask us to kind of take them off of the reoccurring billing because they have life events and whatnot. But recruiting has to stay a priority. Like I was having a conversation with someone and like, you know, you, you'll get a batch of new agents that roll in. Um, and you know, they're going to be productive in six to 12 months from now, maybe, you know? Um, but if you just stop there, like if I judge myself based off of my first 10 agents and, and really want to be critical, um, I would, I wouldn't have the most successful model, um, where the magic really happens is agent 89, 95, 106, agent 115, you know, those are game changers. And to the degree you recruit, you're going to find those people and, you know, it's just, it's just a mindset thing. So for us recruiting, um, you know, we, we look for on an early stage is like, I need something to sell to. Like if you're going on listing appointments without a presentation and it's your first couple listing presentations, you're probably going to feel a little lost and insecure. Like, I don't really know where to go with this conversation. So whenever I took this, this task on of recruiting, I said, you know what, what can I push agents to in order to get them to buy in a little bit, small little commitments, like micro commitments of yeses that could lead to the ultimate yes of coming over and seeing our value. So I call them mousetraps in a sense. And it's, it's like, okay, what can I recruit to? So up front, it's like, Hey, listen, they got to know what you're about. Hey, 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 got to get your attention. Do you know about first class? What do we offer? Blah, blah, blah. hundred percent commission partner model, our agent growth plan, take new agents to top producers, top producers, to team leaders, team leaders, to business owners. We'll lay it all out for you. And we'll save you money along the way. Right. That's a pitch. Everybody's like, I'm good where I'm at. 
of course you're good where you're at, Josh. Like, why would you be? You just found out about us. But hey, listen, if anything were to change, we'd love to be a plan B. And then that conversation goes. Adam on Facebook, um, we created a little Facebook group um, called the KC Realtor Mastermind. We add people to that. And only real estate agents. Only real estate it's agents. It's our recruiter CRM. And so now as we talk to these agents, we dump them in there and we provide value. It's just something, it's just a value. We don't ask those people to come over in those in, in any of those chats. We keep it very neutral. And it's just a place where if people want to learn a little bit more, they can come reach out to us or they can just stay there and enjoy that. Put all of our events on there. And so we po post our events and all that stuff. So then, okay, we have that as like a low level. And then another one is we, you know, for our first like 18 months, dude, we were doing weekly in-person masterminds for weekly. ages. Educational. I mean, dude, the weeks will fly by so fast. I'm like, oh shoot, that's tomorrow. Like it's like Wednesday's hit mastermind. The next day was kind of cool down from it. Friday was prep for the next one. Monday we show up. Oh shoot. It's almost here. Tuesday. It's like, it's tomorrow. And then it's the next day. So we had this cycle of, we were just jamming out on these and, and those were what we'd bring people to, Hey, just come get a feel for where we're at. Um, what we offer love to be a plan B, no commitment, come in late, leave early. doesn't matter. We just want to uh, provide value. A couple things to add on to that. Uh, we have an acronym that we follow Gitmo good enough to move on. We knew that we had to create the systems and the structure to plug someone into. So we no longer had to do that recruiting job. We have a recruiter. She's alone bringing on eight to 10 people a month. And all she's doing is plugging into the systems that we already had. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, marketing over everything, MOE, marketing over everything. You have to market. And I, I heard this on the uh, Rod, Robert Herjavec and Grant Cardone podcast, but Robert said, you can be the best salesperson in the world at your profession, but you can only be selling in one room at a time. Whereas marketing, you can be selling in thousands of doors at the same time. So there's a power with marketing. Mm -hmm. So everything we do, we market it, market our events. We market our uh, agents production, our team production, our office production, uh, any special events or whatever we're marketing it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So then, um, right, and when you speak to, to marketing these things, are these things that, I mean, you're, you're putting, you know, doing like reach awareness, paid ads on, on social media, or are these things that you're just posting and making sure that you're connected with as many people tied to the real estate space in your local community that you possibly can, yeah. um, are these things that you're maybe dumping in the Facebook group that you have for agents in your area? Yeah. I mean, we're pretty much sphere of influence based with our reach. So we don't do very much paid. Um, you know, we will throw out some like job postings and stuff like that, like looking for real estate agents um, that does attract some people like places like Indeed or even on Facebook, you can put some job postings. But technically, we're, you, you know, as a broker, you can subscribe to different lists and you can you can find out all of the information on all the agents in your in your MLS. So we pull that list and then we kind of sick our recruiter on it. We say, hey, reach out to these people and just touch base. Um, you can start low level with like co-op agents. Um, you know, we're doing right now um, about 90 deals a month. Um, and so those are 90 opportunities for our recruiter. So reach out to them, just see how, you know, if they're happy where they're at, what they have going on, just spread the good word of first class. That's all we're doing. And so, you know, we, we kind of do a little bit more of organic um, and I, I would love to get into more automated stuff, but we just found our sweet spot with this and, and it's worked, but you know, things that are manual tend to only work for a season. But when you can build the systems, um, then it should be able to work for a lifetime. So, you know, we're constantly critiquing these things. Um, but as of right now, it's pretty manual. Um, here's, and, yeah. here's a high level tip that we just started implementing. Find a service that you can send out email newsletters to. Find 50 to 100 agents to start with twice a week. Send them some valuable tips in the real estate market that can attract them. And what you'll do is you'll see those people and how many times they're clicking on those emails. We'll get some agents who click on it four to six times uh, per email. Well, guess what our recruiter does? That's her friendly, friendly reach out. Hey, uh, I'd really like to invite you to our next event. Mm -hmm. Boom, they come to the event and before you know it, they're signing up. Yeah. So give more value than their current leader is giving them. And that's going to drive them to your office. Yep, yep, love it. And then the cool thing is, is, Okay, those mastermind events, those are for your agents. You're just inviting right. these potential recruits in as guests. So sure. these are things that you're already are big value adds for your agents. So you're not necessarily adding more work. 
you know, yes. well, now that the recruiter's doing, you know, those reach outs for you guys and yeah. getting them in the seat. So then it's like, okay, the things you're, so you're optimizing time, yes. getting them to experience you, mm -hmm. developing those relationships. That's and when right. you build that ecosystem, now we've got the agents hosting the masterminds. They found something they feel empowered about. We let them share it with everybody else. And now they're, they're doing all the work, but you can't get those right people and the leaders in your office. And unless your focus is recruiting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then when it comes to, to your recruiter, um, cause this is a, a, like recruiters, at least the feedback I get from so many broker owners, it's almost like finding a good recruiter is, is a challenge for them. Like, you know, an agent or a team trying to find a good ISA, like, yeah. and, and, you know, usually it's just, they don't have the right process, you know, whatever it may be, but you know, what have you guys have found to be key to find that right person when it comes to recruiting? Yeah. I, I think a lot of people have the wrong expectations when they, when they start hiring anybody, because usually these people that are bringing on a recruiter, it's probably like their second or third hire and, and they've probably had bad um, goes at it prior to that. Um, I think starting with very low expectations and keeping the task very, very small. Like dude, when I was in the military, it was like, uh, learn how to fold socks, like get really good at folding socks. That was boot camp. <laughs> like, and so um, when you're bringing on a recruiter, man, it's like, it's an investment. So just whatever you, whatever you figure out the salary is, you're going to pay them per month. Just multiply that by three and give it a 90 day go. And, and we have this, this is our, our philosophy with it. Month one, we do check-ins every 30 days. So month one is you can't do anything wrong. It's all on me. So your lack of production, lack of performance, I'm not going to expect anything out of you really for that first 90 days. But at the, at the first 30, any problems you run into or snags, it's, it's all on me. What can I do? I didn't put this in place. Like you fail to the level of your systems and processes like you always teach. And so I figure, okay, I'm going to take extreme ownership of that. You do no wrong. Next 30 days, hey, it's kind of equal, 50-50. You know, we've worked through some of the kinks. I've worked through my kinks. You're working through your kinks. We should, it should kind of be mutual in, in um, taking accountability. Last, you know, 30 days, that's where we really test you and say, okay, let operate for 30 days. I'm going to be pretty much hands off, but you know, we'll be here if you need me. Um, but you should be just doing the tasks we asked for. So I think 60 days on the job, you should be pretty much like, like feeling like you're settled in. Cause let's be honest for the first few weeks at a new job, you don't even know where the light switches are. Like you're walking around the office and everything feels so foreign. So I'm going to expect you to come in Josh week one and just dominate. Like I, like this is, everything's new. It's a new language most of the time. And you know, all of our recruiters we brought on, they weren't agents prior to this. They just had good personalities. They were willing to learn and implement. And they were, they were just like, pretty much like, yes, I can do that. Like that was their attitude. And so they were up for the challenge. And, and, you know, we just made very easy guidelines. We, you know, we, like we said, Gitmo, get enough to move on. We made our systems good enough to where I want my recruiter to come in and have something to sell. And if they can't sell anything, then I like, I don't have a good enough product. So that's where we really worked out the kinks with how to, how to structure the invites for the mastermind. Me and him need to do a really good job at, at coming up with, you know, what are they called? Like, what's it going to be about? Can we drive traffic there? The marketing's on us up front. So we needed a product for them to sell to. Um, but yeah, so like, that's, that's how we laid it out. And it was just, just like this, like recruiter, me first 30 days. I was on your hip, like whatever you need, I got you. Like we're doing this together because prior to bringing on a recruiter, I was already doing it on my own. So a lot of leaders will jump in and say, I hired you, you go. I'm bad at recruiting. So you recruit for me. And they, they, they just are out the door. You don't see them. Like we made that mistake with our first couple of hires. We thought that we could bring them in one day of orientation and just leave them alone. Like that's just, I failed those people. And you just got to be able to take ownership of that. Yeah, I think it's a lot like McDonald's can bring in a, a high school kid and put them on a job with a week's training mm -hmm. because their systems are so dialed in. So when we got to that point and we were able to plug them into the systems, plug them into everything the franchise offers, I mean, it's, it's easy. Now, she had no experience in real estate or recruiting. She's bringing on eight to 10 people a month, every single month. It's not yeah. rocket science. You just got to, you got to do it on your own, get it good enough to move on, then fire yourself from that position by hiring somebody in, letting them shadow underneath you for 30 days, monitor them for the next 30, and then let them do their thing on the last 30 and then evaluate what you want to do with it. When it really gets fun is if one recruiter can bring in eight agents, couldn't two recruiters bring in 16 agents? Yeah. Why not? And then you hire that third, they bring in 24, then it ups the game of the other two. 
Oh yeah, yeah exactly. And I, I hear all the time from team leaders, broker owners, they're like, yeah, in the next five years, I want to get to 25 agents. And I'm like, oh, you're not even hitting the good ones. Guess what happens when you have 130 agents? They just organically start coming in. Yeah. Word of mouth, you know, uh, the events get bigger. Everything gets better when you hit that hundredth agent. So saying, Hey, I want to hit 25 agents over the next five years. You're not even getting the good people in. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the law of numbers. The more people you have in, the more leaders you're going to find, the better agents you're going to find. Yeah. You can't push someone to be productive past the point in which they want to be productive. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, I have this conversation a lot with, with other leaders. Um, well, they're, they'll ask me like, Hey man, how, how do I go out there and recruit you know, top producers, how do I go out there? And, and, you know, a question that I always ask them is I'm like, well, a statement followed by a question, but it's okay. N n nobody's going to follow anybody that they deem to be weaker than them. So then I'll mm -hmm. ask them like, okay, what are you doing to become a stronger leader? So then that you become a strong enough leader that those that are high producers are willing to follow, you know, I, I mean, if you can't bring anything of value to the game, you can't transfer that, that value to them so they can continue to grow. Like, so, you know, like that's your, you know, you're, you're, you're recruiting low level people because you're a low level leader, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. So with that being said, like, what do you guys do to continue to raise your John C. Maxwell term of leadership lid, you know, yeah. so that way, you know, um, people don't necessarily outgrow your organization and you can get that top talent. Yeah, I do. We just, when we start thinking bigger, that's when we start attracting better people. Yeah. And up front, it's almost like, uh, a new agent, they feel like they can only attract $150,000 clients. So what are they marketing towards? $150,000 clients. Me and David back early in 2021, I believe it was, we were still in production. We went and toured new construction every day. We marketed new construction. We had new construction seminars and all those other things. First, first quarter in that business, we had brought in eight clients for new construction and six of them had to sell. It's like what you market expands and people, you're right. People will come and stay under you based off of your leadership. The competency so, of the leader. The competency. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And you know, it's, yeah. Like, like what keeps us going is like, what's next? Like we got to keep asking ourselves that, you know, it's like we dialed in, we know we needed recruiters and we needed a, or we needed a recruit. So we hired recruiter and, you know, we sat there for a while because it's so easy just to sit in this place of, we don't have a dedicated manager at our office. Me and him are running it. And now we're thinking of, okay, well, whenever we start moving to the next step of like, we're selling franchises now nationwide. So we're helping people literally open up offices and do exactly what we did when they're only doing a couple deals a month. Like, but they have the mindset and the drive. Like we're literally showing them how to do it and we can get them into production and up and running and out of production within a six month turnaround time, we believe, because we've done it with, you know, not once, but twice, twice. And so you know, for us, like us thinking about that, okay, that's kind of daunting. Well, now we start thinking about, okay, when we're not here, how, like, this was a question I asked early at the beginning of the year. It says, um, will you, uh, will your business um, run without you? And, you know, usually people say yes, but will it grow without you? Yeah. And like, that is such a different question. And we asked ourselves that, okay, what does it take to grow? So we really looked down and we said, okay, if we want to hire a manager to come in here and grow and drive this business, we have to create the blueprint for them. So we've created this little system and, you know, it's something we're kind of, it, it's a, it's a trend right now in the ecosystem we're in with coaching with like Tom Ferry and all that stuff with, cause we're in like the team coaching and all that. So we talk to broker owners and other things in different markets, but it's like create pods within your team. So we have like on our split plan, um, we have about 70, 80 agents on there. And so we're thinking we'll take our top 10, seven to 10 agents um, that are ready to be in mentorship type roles. And they're going to be our senior partner agents in a sense, like that's kind of what we're labeling it. And then they're going to have pods within the team. So they're going to have mentees under them. And so it just creates this hierarchy of structure where people don't feel like they're kind of lost. And, you know, we have a lot of fail safes in our brokerage right now where people are very well taken care of, but this will just take us to the next level. Because my thing is when I bring in a manager, like a high, high performing manager, what keys am I handing them? Is it a Ferrari or is it a busted, you know, coupe, you know, hoopty? And, and so it's like, 
I need to know that they have something that they can manage, just like my recruiter. Like if I bring in a recruiter, I got to make sure they have events to recruit to and a product that's sexy enough. We did that. Now my manager needs something to manage. And that's where we're coming in is like, okay, let's really establish and, and build this team inside of the brokerage to be one of the top teams in our town. Um, not only with top growing brokerages, but top performing teams as well. And so we're playing with that model because when I bring my manager in, my manager has an objective. They have a mission. And they're not just sitting there just looking at like, this is so great. We're closing 90 deals a month. Um, it's like, no, you have something to drive now. And so we're building that out. I just had a call with a couple different, you know, team leaders um, that are under brokerages running teams and they're doing something similar. Their margins are great. Like you had mentioned, I think earlier um, where you said, you know, you can stay small, kind of like a team brokerage and have high margins. I want that within the team. So we're going to, we're building that out as we speak. Um, but that's, that's our kind of what's next. So that got us thinking, okay, we're, we're selling offices nationwide doing that. Now, how do, how, who's going to run the ship back home and make sure this grows without us. We need them to have a compelling vision, mission, and something to do on a regular basis. Yeah. So that's what, that's what we're building out as we speak. Yeah. yeah no, I mean, cause it, cause look, dude, if you don't give a platform for your people to continue to grow within, they're going to outgrow you. Yes. Yes. Yeah, right. And, right. and this is why so many brokers are like anti big teams because they know at some point that team is going to become their competition, open up their own brokerage. And, you know, right. um, um, and I learned that the hard way, you know, running a very traditional team, 50 50 splits is like, okay, every 25 months, man, it was like a revolving door, people leaving, people leaving. Yes. Well, man, they built up their own SOI, they knew how to lead generate. Mm -hmm. okay, I'm not going to pay a 50 50 split. You know, um, um, but yeah, creating that progressive Love model, that. like you mentioned, where it's like, okay, you know, they can be on the team, then they can, you know, transition, kick ass, go as an individual agent, then they can start developing their team. And then eventually, for those that choose to go to that next level, okay, now we can, you know, partner on some type of, of their own brokerage. 100%. You know, and yeah, having the right leverage pieces, you know, this was a tough lesson for me to learn, but it was like, you know, you can only work so many hours in a day. You can only go so fast. And those that just murder it at levels that it's hard to fathom, it's not like they're going that much harder or faster. Cause again, you can only go so hard and fast. It's like yep. they figure out the better leverage components. And, right. you know, as an example of that, you know, um, you know, I started, okay, let me, let me then start going after and developing teams inside my organization, you know, mm -hmm. so instead of me growing my own team, which, you know, I'm doing that, but then let me go out there and develop other team leaders and help them grow the shit out of their teams, you know, um, but then now they're growing, they're expanding, they're recruiting one, two agents every single week. Yeah. You know, I mean, I have one team that, you know, went from three agents to 28 agents in six months now and do that again. They're, and they're not, you know, like a typical team where it's like, okay, like they can't feed those agents. They have so much business coming in that we, their biggest problem is we can't get them enough agents fast enough. You know, yeah. um, but it's just that leverage component. And you guys have yes. created a next step where then it's like, okay, now for those that want to go out there in our area or anywhere nationwide, if I heard that correctly, where now mm -hmm. you're able to go, you know, um, either sell anywhere. them a franchise, partner with them on a franchise. Like, what does that look like? Like, what is that? I mean, are you guys partnering on these or you did you just work something out with your company where you can just, you know, sell them the franchise and kind of act as a mentor? Yeah. So a couple of things I want to touch on real quick before David goes into this mm -hmm. is you're absolutely right. If your company, you want to bring on the most agents and have the most success, you have to have a growth plan for those people. I don't know how many agents, if we would have stopped at that mindset of, Hey, I want to keep the team brokerage inside the office, how many people we would have lost, but no, because we've got something else for them all the time that they can go into. We've got a gal right now, just like you said, she's brought on 20 agents in less than six months. And what's next for her? Possibly opening up another office. So there's always something from being a top producer, team leader to a business owner and the platform already has it lined out. So yeah, just want to touch on that. Yeah, exactly. Right. And like the growth plan is huge. And so like, like, I just know that whenever people hear the word brokerage, like I'm the broker, I'm going to be my own brokerage. I just know all of these intrusive thoughts that creep in and they come fast, hot and heavy. Like they won't express all of their concerns to us up front. The liability. The liability, all these things, man. But when you, when you figure out that just playing small and being like an agent that's busy, that's way more stressful than running a brokerage the size of ours. Like working with four buyers, you know, even a couple buyers a month. And like a listing, dude, that's more of a headache than running an office. I promise you that. 
especially the way we run it. Like we run profit first. Like we, you never go out of business making a profit. We always drive those numbers. And we do that because we have the systems in place. So we try to take it back to people. We're like, bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. Don't think about all this stuff you have to do. Just know it's one step at a time. Just like how any successful agent starts to build their business. They don't implement everything at once. And then now they just have all these problems. It's like they start with one thing and build on it. So whenever we're, we're helping out these agents, it depends. Like where are they at in the growth of their business? Is it just two hustlers like how me and Ryan were? And they don't, they've never hired an agent or maybe they brought on their first agent. And it's kind of been a flop. Okay, well, maybe we're going to help. We're going to partner with them on that office. And then you're literally going to tap into everything we've built and have our systems in place like because the franchise has all their systems but we can we can dumb it down for them to their level and literally just say do this right now do this right now do this and so we can do that with them or if they're already cooking and they got a pretty good flow going and they want to save more money and have the ability to grow and scale and win twice like we talked about earlier dude open your own and then we're just going to be there as support because you have all the franchise owners you can tap into at any given time like Early on, man, we were on weekly calls with the founder of First Class um, because he shares his Calendly link. Um, and then we jump on secondary calls with the top uh, franchises in the country, and we would jam out with them too. So that was us. That's what we did to get where we're at. And so we would provide that same exact support for anybody else that wants to do this. And you will quickly realize running a team is way more complicated, hectic, and stressful than running a brokerage because you're paying so much to keep that team running. Whereas at the, at the brokerage model, you're the, you're the guy, the buck stops with you, guy, gal, whatever it is. And so now you control the profit line, the revenue, um, and you can make those decisions and empower your agents. Yeah. A couple of questions I like to ask team leaders is, one, if you were a successful agent, would you work for you, right? And then two is, as a team leader, what's next? So you those are really got to think about that because you know if you're if you're running as an individual agent, top producer, it's like you're always in this vicious cycle of you get a client, you lose a client, you get a client, you sell a client, you get a client, you close a client. Maybe they come back, they whatever. Everything's fleeting. Um, when you're growing out a team and you make recruiting a priority, it's like you bring on an agent. It's like the agent. Gets a client, closes a deal, gets another client, closes another deal, gets a client, closes another deal, and maybe they go do something else, right? Um, but our, at our brokerage, you can keep that, that agent on your team model, and then when they're ready to go to that next step, they don't leave your company. They just change split plans. They keep more commission. So now they can grow a team underneath and repeat that cycle. So you're literally going wide and you're creating more opportunity for people because right now, I don't know of any other brokerages that will offer you a plan, a split plan that's similar to these big box companies, such as like KW or Remax or whatever. Um, we provide way more support and training for that split and also offers 100% commission at the same time where you don't have to earn it. You just literally submit it, like just reach out to us and say, hey, I'm ready to go 100% commission and we just flip a switch and you keep that. You don't have to transfer brokerages. I literally did that in Arizona. If you look up my department of real estate license history, I went from KW to West USA Realty like four times because <laughs> I, I was at KW and I'm like, they have all the answers. I took Ignite, did bold, had some people in there that I, I jammed out with to do prospecting calls. And then I'm like, Nobody showed up. I'm kind of doing this on my own and I'm, I'm out door knocking. The brokerage doesn't give me any deals. I don't like paying them 30%. Um, let me go to flat fee company. So I transferred to flat fee company. I'm like, oh, it's kind of lonely over here. If I had an accountability partner, I did that song and dance four times. And, and so whenever we opened this company, it, it just aligned with that. I'm like, I didn't have to switch from KW to West USA Realty. I could have just stayed with first class and just bounced between the partner model and the entrepreneur model. Team model, 100% commission model. I could have done that nine times if I wanted to, um, to make myself feel comfortable enough to expand and grow the business that I saw, uh, me going towards. Oh, third question. I like to ask team leaders and it's one of my favorite ones. Speaking about the liability of a brokerage, uh, when's the last time you talked to your brokerage or had an issue to where you had to bring it up with your brokerage? 99% of them said, I haven't talked to that dude in months. Mm -hmm. Damn. Yeah. I haven't talked to mine in years. Yeah. Yeah, you know, exactly. I don't see him. I don't talk to him. I don't fucking I never hear from him. They never hear from me. You know, yeah. now There's insert so you as the brokerage. Now, now you're the broker. And yeah. if you still want to be in production, be in production. That's fine. Like, that's totally good. You know, um, but those agents that we have systems in place that where it's an ecosystem and they all kind of answer their own questions. And we have regular calls like group calls, things like that. It's really fun and inclusive. And we built it the way. I wish I could have stepped into day one when I was a licensed agent. Yep. Yeah. Like, so, point blank. So, you know, like you mentioned before, um, you know, the founder of first class, long-term, 
you know, one of my best closest friends in, in personal life That's and awesome. in business and, you know, Ryan Finch, amazing cat. Um, and one of the things that, you know, I'm, I really love of, of what he's built and you guys have built is for those that want to get started with their own franchise. It's like, dude, you can get started $500 a month. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, uh, with not, I mean, essentially no other fees. You, mm -hmm. you, there's a virtual option. Um, you hire your first agent, you're profitable out of the gate. And then of course they put packaged in, like you said, all the systems, the training, the ancillaries, you know, cause I mean the, the broker, like if you look at Rheology's model, it's like, okay, want to get every, every franchise to five revenue sources as quick as possible, you know? Yeah. So company yeah. dollars and maybe insurance, mortgage, title, property management, whatever that may be. Sure. You know, it's like, okay, like you guys have all those in place, plug and play, you know, you can start building those out, so you can profit out of the gate. Um, where then you look at, you know, most average franchises in this industry, after you do the initial buy-in, then you do the TI requirement build outs. You know what? I mean, you're sometimes multiple six figures deep before you're even able to start turning a profit. Yeah. You know, um, so it allows just that, that, you know, skinny scalability, you know, um, uh, to be able to go fast um, and build a company right by, by, like you mentioned, that profit first model. Mm -hmm. um, now, a question that I want to ask you guys is, you know, um, because, you know, it's like EXPs of the world have become. Yeah. You know, it, obviously a popular thing. And, and, sure. and this is, you know, I get this question a lot too, you know, cause I kind of keep a neutral, like I'm not with any yeah. of these companies, you know, right. And, you know, and obviously being a coach, like I've got clients from all over, so sure. I've got to look yeah. at it from a neutral perspective. And I think that there's pros and cons of each, you know, um, uh, but it's like, okay, Hey, I could go that, that EXP route. And, and, and not have maybe the liability, you know, yeah, you're not having a sellable product either. And, you know, um, but build up rev share, like, like what, what do you guys see is the benefits of going with the model that you did versus like for somebody that's on the fence with that? I'm sure maybe mm -hmm. you guys get this question. Like a people like, oh, a thousand hey, percent. go with you. It was in our head in the beginning. Okay. Yeah. So um, when we think about the rev share model is, you know, are you able to bring people in and then keep those people in that retention model? Because, you know, for whatever the, the, commission plan is or the structure is on that revenue share, are they going to stay in that? And are you going to give the value for them to stay in that based off of, you know, the amount of money that you get for those people? Right? Yeah, and, I, I think, you know, some people, um, they, they jump into it for the wrong reasons into those revenue models, um, because there are a percentage of people in those type of companies that are absolutely crushing it. You know, but whenever I hear somebody say that their five year plan is to make 15 grand a month passively and they have the qualities that 5X me and Ryan's qualities of leadership and scalability and all of that, I think you're in the wrong vehicle. I'm like, okay, so you're going to get to 300 agents and make 15 grand a month passive. Like, okay, to the average listener, that probably sounds amazing, right? Sure, it does. Absolutely. But with a company that you own, a franchise model that you operate, you could be there six months, 12 months, two years, whatever pace you want to operate at, you can be like, you know, our metric is, is like, I want to get to 20 grand profit a month as quickly as possible. And so we went that path. And then once you get that open, call an ice cream shop, you get that ice cream shop running, let's open the next one. And so that's what we're literally duplicating and running. And so it's like, when you're on that model, it's just like, we go back to the risk thing. It's like, I've been burned in other, like by giving up control and not owning. And, and if you're like, if we boil it down to everybody's drive to be in real estate typically comes down to making money. Yes. Like 80 to 90% of millionaires get that way through real estate and the long-term agents that survive through this industry, they find out pretty quick, they get burnt out by selling houses and, and, and talking to agents and all this stuff and, all, and whatnot. They, they start buying rentals and they start building up their portfolio and they become uh, financially independent, financially free. Like, so why not, while you're growing your real estate operations and selling houses, be building that in, you know, that financially independent model as well by opening and running your own company. Like and, that's what we saw. Yeah. And I see it as, Hey, it's great compared to the, the first companies who, Hey, we're on a split. Um, this is what you get. You get what you get and that's it. So with these other companies, they did a great job by offering more value than what the other companies did. But I think there's a better vehicle in this industry. And I think it, it is first class. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, I, think, I mean, if I look at like, you know, just from a very high level, it's like, okay. Yeah. I mean, both you can build up, like you mentioned, you know, like make money as you're doing it, 
you know, so I could go build my downline there. I could go grow my first class, you know, whatever, I'm making that money, you know, but there's only one of the models that then I have a sellable product, yeah. you know, um, and then the vulnerabilities, you know, right. And again, I mean, I hope I don't piss anybody off that's watching this. And again, I'm very neutral here. I don't, you know, I, I don't believe that there's a best. It's everybody has to decipher what that best right. is for each of us, you know, but, um, you know, I know a handful of friends of mine that have built big downlines that then got the boot nothing real estate related, nothing to do with, oh, they, you know, did something shady or wrong with the transaction. It was because of personal views that they posted on social media, like all this freaking censorship shit that's going around that we all witnessed through COVID and political times of people getting mm -hmm. banned off Twitter or whatever. Um, but this company did that same thing to them and they lost everything overnight, you know, and, and, and those are rare cases. Mm -hmm. I get that, you know, but it, again, it's, you know, just assessing, Every, every move that we make has different exposure, different risk. So it's assessing, okay, which exposure and risk am I, I you know, willing to take on? Which ones am I not willing to take on? And again, yeah. what do I want most? Dude, I you just know? thought about this too. Like, you know, how susceptible is your license to being suspended or revoked? You go get a Dewey, like get a DUI one night, boom, license gone. How are you compensated based on a downline? Through referral revenue share. Like you have to have an active real estate license in order to be compensated. Okay, something like that unfortunately happens to me. I own the company. I lose my license. Put a new broker in place. I still own it. Yeah. I like I, you know, like okay, um, like I'm not out of business. And one question I would ask if you're looking at both models is are you more likely to have a a market presence in your current market to have something that you can pitch out to those people? Or are you more likely to recruit people from other states and other areas? 99% of the people who don't have a global presence inside these companies are more likely to establish something inside their market presence. And establishing something in their market presence, are they more likely to make more money under this model or the other model? Mm -hmm. By owning it, you're not sharing revenue. Therefore, you keep the revenue. Therefore, anyone that comes in under you has the ability to scale under you. Whereas companies put caps and percentages on the agents. It's going to be very hard to keep those agents for a long amount of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It can't be. And then, and then, you know, yeah, yeah, you look at like, look, I have some friends, good, good, close personal friends that are AXP that freaking murder it on Me too. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Um, but what I think that the average person, that is looking that sees those numbers that gets attracted to those doesn't understand is all right like what is the commonality of everybody that i know that's making six plus figures on a month with 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 residual rev share um do they're freaking brilliant marketers yes. like they know yeah. how to market and it's a full fucking time job right yeah, like, like, time. like you're traveling the scenes, nonstop. Like, when they're building that up dude they are strategic they're intentional yes it, so it's like okay like so you combine true. those things with you know, hard work plan strategy, plus they're just, you know, fucking just, you know, masters at marketing and, 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 and it's again, not everybody cares to make six figures. They're like, Hey, if I can make 10 grand a month, that'd be epic. And, and maybe it doesn't take that to build that. But, um, yeah. I, yeah. That's I, the question I ask people is you've been at EXP now for three years. What does your downline look like? Are, do you plan to somehow exponentially grow that over the next three years? Mm -hmm. And like, typically dude, it's not the case. You know, I, yeah, like, you know, I've seen some cats on here. Um, Like this one dude brought on 100 agents a month in one month. Um, Like having that kind of presence to a yeah. company like that. Like, okay, that'll, that'll, that'll move the the needle, you know? Um, But it's like a lot of these agents, you know, what's the statistics? 87% of agents fail. Good market, bad market, neutral market. The statistic remains the same. So what does that tell me? Most agents live in an economic crisis in their head on a regular basis. Yeah. So you're telling me that, you know, the bulk of those agents at these other companies are going to remain there and, and drive and push for, you know, down the road money when they're struggling right now. So yeah. it's a down the road play. And what we and Ryan have managed to do is we, we are able to do both keep right now money and build down the road money. Cause when we build this thing to a thousand agents locally and then have multiple offices open nationwide, I mean, when we look back five to 10 years from now, I think we're going to say we planted a, a, you know, a really good seed that grew into a massive tree that takes care of us for generations to come as well. So it's, yeah. we're, we're doing both. And I think, you know, with other plays by just parking yourself under a rev share type company, you're only, you're, you're playing one angle of the game. 
Um, and you know, it's just, you, you should really evaluate that. Yeah. And you, you build it to a thousand agents locally and then you stack on mortgage insurance title, you know, and, and other ancillaries, you know, like then so. it's, yeah, it, it is, it's mm -hmm. game over. And that's what, man, like, you know, and it all came back to that question of like, do we want to keep doing what we're doing right now for one year, two year, five years? Do we want to keep doubling our goals or do we want to grow a business? Like, I, I, like, I don't know. I, I feel like most people get into real estate to grow a business, but they get distracted by real estate. Number like, one question you need to ask yourself getting started is how many months can you go without a paycheck? What does this dictate? Yeah, it dictates, you know, do you run or do you walk in this industry? And then how long will you be able to survive or last any type of shift? It's Too many times people require that commission money that they have coming in just to sustain the lifestyle that they're sustaining. They can't take a step back for the next six months and really build something that's going to outproduce their own commission and move it into a business where it's passive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, yeah. So we're, we're able to keep more money, retain more agents and grow this wider. And it's a long-term play and we can play in the short term right now if we want to as well, yep. uh, unfazed. And so it's just, you know, now we got options. And so, you know, we asked that question of if we have evaluated both models and all of that we have, and, and we just, this is the path we're on. And I think a lot of agents in their local market can relate to that. Um, yep. and I, I hope that they, they connect to this message too, you know? You awesome. can do it. If we can do it, you can do it. Mm -hmm. All right. So I got, I got a couple more questions for you guys. Are you guys okay on time? Yeah. Yeah. We got okay. Okay. Time. Um, but before I get to these other questions, just because we just, you know, we're talking about your guys' model and, and your ability, mm -hmm. you know, because I mean, again, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it sounds to me like anybody that's watching or listening to this, whether they're in Arizona, Florida, Kansas City, like anybody you guys have that I guess that's maybe in the US, you know, maybe yeah. not. You know, but um, maybe there's some restrictions to it. But if they're interested in learning more about this, or 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 you know, starting a first class franchise, you know, that's something that you can facilitate and help them with. And if so, yeah. like, where's the best place to reach out to you guys to get in touch with you to learn more about that? Yeah, you know, and one thing we wanted to give away is uh, just a one on one call with us. Uh, we do these all the time to kind of evaluate where you're at in the business, and you can pull our or pick our brains and ask us questions based off of. Uh, how we were able to grow and see if it's the right fit for you. But uh, we'll share the link with you and hopefully you can share it in this video. So we'll do a free Calendly link and it's, you know, they're usually they're blocked for 30 minutes, but man, we, we usually go for an hour and a half on these calls. So <laughs> it, yeah. we love this stuff, honestly, no matter where you're at in the business, staying put, thinking of moving, just pick our brains. We're happy to help. Thousand so yeah, that's people can reach out that way. Yep. Yep. Love it. All right. So then, um, all right, so you guys are business partners. Yep. And man, business partnerships can be messy. They can be, they can be hard. They can be challenging, but oh, if done boy. right, they can be brilliant, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so, and I've been, unfortunately, in, in both of those situations where it's uh, like, mm -hmm. I'll have some partnerships from like, I couldn't fathom life without it, but then I've had more than not where it's been like, what the fuck did I get myself into? Yeah. And I got to get out of this as quickly as I possibly can. Yeah. You know, um, so what, what has been, you know, I don't want to say the secret, uh, uh, but like what, what has been like, what, what has allowed your guys' partnership to work so well? Mm. Uh, communication. Like, and then also like, you got to get over the, the early stages of assuming what the other person's thinking, I, I believe. Like I, I'm, at, I'm a little lucky. Um, my wife's a clinical psychologist. She has a thriving private practice. Just published her book, um, Insomnia Docs, Insomnia Docs Sleep Guide to Restful Sleep, or something like that. I forget the name of it. It just launched. It's on Amazon, and Audible. But um, shameless <laughs> plug. plug. Well, so man, she's been crucial in helping us kind of just like approach conversations in a constructive way. And I think you know. Whether that's personally, if you run into a lot of things on your own, go to therapy, get those thoughts out, have someone to vent to. Me and Ryan, we've known each other since high school, you know, eighth grade wrestling. We we're always wrestling partners. He's always outweighed me by 30 pounds. Um, so I've had to learn how to put the whooping on him, even though he's smothering me. Um, but he's aggressive. He fights hard. So he always ends up kicking my ass. Um, but we just like early on, man, it's just having those conversations. Like when something feels weird, just talk about it. And like, you know, one thing that we do as well is to try to unpersonalize it. Um, take that thing you're talking about. And I learned this from Tim Ferriss. I believe it was. 
but like, this is the thing you're complaining about. Like I'm bitching about Ryan because of this, this thing, him. Well, we turn it into an object and we put it on the table and now we talk about it as like, as its own thing. And I'm not pointing it directly to Ryan as like, it's Ryan's problem or my problem. It's like, let's discuss the issue and then come to a, like a, a level-headed conclusion on like, did I fuck up? Did you fuck up? Like being willing to just say like, Hey, sorry, I, I totally dropped the ball on that. Or, you know, even just the other day, like I was kind of like getting on to Ryan for something. And I'm like, dude, my bad. I came at you too heavy on that, you know? And like, just being able to just say that, like call it out when you're like, a little too much or something like that. Yeah. And another thing is, do they play well with your uh, personality and your strengths? So mm -hmm. me and David, we are uh, very different people. I love to implement things, drive things, keep track of things and maintain things. David's more of the visionary. He likes to come up with the ideas, the structure. I bring the fires. He, he puts them into place. So um, having that, like, I remember in the beginning when we were just starting out our team, my goal was to go get a hundred transactions. David's goal was to try to, uh, get other people to do all of his work and <laughs> leverage those things. So, but in the beginning when there wasn't anything to leverage, yeah, we had a lot of, I'm like, dude, I'm going on 10 listing appointments, all these buyer consult or consultations, bringing in all this money. And you're trying to put more stuff on my plate or other people's plate. And, uh, but that does have a place in this business and we would not be able to scale without it, without the ideas, without the, um, the way to put systems into place to maintain those things without us in it. Uh, I would just be, you know, cranking deals. So, yeah. Yeah. And then one thing we did pretty often was we created T-charts and oh, we yeah. would list out, like I would have my own T-chart. He'd have his own T-chart. Uh, left side is things you like to do. Right side is things you don't like to do. List those out and then compare charts. And then that really helps you draw a line because we noticed we were doing the same freaking tasks. Yeah. And that always kind of bugged me because I had the vision of scaling and growing. I'm like, dude, you should have your own department because you're good at this. I should have my own department. But early on, like we both kind of need to be working on the same things. And that always frustrated me. And so then I would kind of butt heads. I'm like, why don't you see it the way I see it? I, like that was always my underlying yeah. thought. And then that would come in the form of me being harsh or like unable to empathize for him and things like that. So it was just like, those T charts helped to really just sort things out for us. Um, and then, and then from those T charts, we came up with one and done lists. So we would create, okay, everything we don't like doing. If, if it's, if his don't like, isn't my like to do whose job is that? Right. And so we would try to figure out who's going to take responsibility for that. So we come up with the one and done list with our, our don't likes, and we'd figure out how are we going to outsource these? And, um, and then the things we like to do, we just came on to common ground of like, okay, in this season of business, this is what we need to focus on. And we're just going to divide and conquer. Staying in your lane, like figuring out what your lane is and staying in that lane and just knowing that the other person's doing their lane and doing their job. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, so T charts, one and done list, staying in your lane and just having open communication. Um, that's been huge and, and just working through the problems. Cause it's not when conflict's going to occur it, it, or it's not if it's when. Um, yeah. and so like it's never the end of the world. Like these yeah. conversations, they, you know, they have like a curve to them and it's like up front, it's like, okay, something happened. And then everything gets elevated. And then at this peak elevation, it feels like you just want to kill each other and call it quits. But if you just hang on a little bit longer and just get your thoughts out and where you're coming from and how the other person received it, you're going to notice you're going to come down. You'll just notice like, like that, the tension drops in the room and it's weird. You're like, okay, I don't feel as confrontational anymore you don't either and i think we're kind of understanding where we're coming from yep and having those conversations like we can have those conversations pretty quick yeah like they don't shit ryan used to not talk to me for like two weeks about something yep and then out of nowhere he'd drop a bomb on me i'm like dude why didn't you bring that up last week <laughs> like we're I, I have something else in my head i'm working on and now you're bitching about that um and so we just being able to call each other out really helped out a ton so i think just having some like wherewithal to just hang in those conversations and conflicts and knowing like, dude, we're not firing each other. We're not quitting. We just need to get through this little like misunderstanding. Yep. You have to have the same vision too. Vision's important. Yeah. Vision's just knowing that you're driving in the same direction. These allergies yep. are killing Ryan right now, by the way. Yep. He's <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Dude, it's <laughs> going on everywhere, man. Everywhere I'm talking to has been in, in, in my kids, man. Um, all right. So, you know, like I said, I've had some really bad ones and I've had some you know, really good ones. And when it comes to partnerships and 
you know, just how my mind works. I'm kind of, you know, engineer minded where I got to, I got to reverse engineer everything. I got to break it down, put it into a process, simplify it. And so over the years, I've come up with, you know, five key traits that must exist for a successful partnership. And the reason why I want to share these with you guys, because you, you guys are obviously have such a great partnership. I want to see if there's any holes in my theory here. Okay. Um, yeah. And and a lot of these, I mean, it seems to me like, you know, as you know, you're sharing those with me, kind of hit it on most of the, or all the buckets here. Um, but number one, shared vision, you know, so long-term vision is the same. Like one of my partnerships at one point, you know, I mean, we had great skill sets. We, you know, had opposite strengths, you know, whatever, but, you know, we get got to a certain point of, of, of revenue. Now we also had like a 30 year age gap. Um, where they were like, Hey man, like we're each making three and a grand a year. Life is good. We're only having to work about 10, 15 hours a week. And I'm like, Hey dude, I want to take over the world and keep growing this thing. Yep. You know, so the shared vision. So it just created so much conflict. So, you know, shared long-term vision, mm -hmm. um, uh, number one, number two, shared core values, you know? So, okay. Like, uh, I, you know, okay. My business partner's at the strip club every night, cheating on his wife, you know, whatever it, it's like, <laughs> yep. okay. Like there, there's going to be some conflicts there, personal mm -hmm. and business, you know, with that. Um, uh, so number three, opposite superpower. You know, meaning like I'm, I don't want a business partner that's a clone in myself. Yep. They need to have their strengths where it's my weaknesses. Now we can complement or two, you know, one plus one doesn't equate to two. It, one plus one now equates to five, right? Yeah, that's um, right. Shared sacrifices, you know, so, okay, if I have a business partner that, uh, you know, wants to pull out every penny of profit, every penny of profit and wants to go out there and buy freaking mansions and Lambos and I'm like, no, we need to you know, not take any money out, live like we're broke, re, you know, build that so we can save up for future acquisitions, you know, um, so, you know, monetary sacrifices, but then also, you know, that comes into the amount of work that you're willing to put in. Are you willing to work seven days? You know, like, cause if, if I'm working seven days a week, 80 hours a week, and my partner's only doing, you know, three, you know, three days a week, working 20 hours. Okay. There's going to be resentment there. Yep. Um, and then the last one shared growth philosophy. Um, uh, you know, so what is our expansion of growth philosophy? So then, you know, we're able to grow as leaders with the organization. And part of growth philosophy is, okay, being able to have those constructive criticism, you know, co uh, criticism conversations yeah. with each other and, and understand that it's all to facilitate growth. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And w with the, um, the opposite superpowers, we were at this little retreat in Texas and this guy was like, man, you guys are spitting images of this book I just read and it's called rocket fuel. Yep. And it talks about the VI duo visionary and integrator. And, um, cause like every, every massive company tends to have this in common, like whether it's Ford, um, or it's Walt Disney or like these other things, like they always have that person behind the scenes being the hammer and the other person up front casting the vision. Um, and I think me and him, when, when we were reading that book, it talks about the gripes and complaints. It sounds like you're familiar with the book as well. The gripes and complaints of like, what does a visionary think of the integrator? And then, and then what is the, and he's more of the integrator. What does the integrator think of the visionary? He would send me snippets on audible and being like, he's like, makes a lot of sense, huh? And he's like, and then he'd like put in expletives, like lazy bitch, like what, I don't, whatever. We're just, <laughs> we just talk shit. Um, and then I would send him my snippets and I'm like, oh yeah, what about this? And then it also talks about the strengths too. And then it talks about how they share in that, um, in, in like the crucial elements of the business that you need both. Like one's not better than the other. And so it, yeah, like all of these are, are, are awesome. Yeah, we've had great partnerships and we've had bad partnerships. We had a partnership with a mortgage company and, you know, come to find out that he didn't want to work that hard, that he was cool with the money he was bringing in and he wasn't willing to do anything to grow it the, to the scale that we wanted to grow it. So we had to get out of that and it sucked, but it's always better in the future. So if you're in a partnership where you can kind of tell that these things are going on, man, it's, it's better to pull out early than to yeah. push it down the road. So yeah. have those conversations almost on the spot. Like, don't let it fester. Like maybe take a little bit to really like conceptualize what you're going to talk about. And, you know, you can maybe even type out some bullet points you want to cover, think on it for a little bit, but don't let it last more than like yeah. two days, you know, like really just get after it. And hey, if we're not on the same vision, like totally cool, but we need to go our separate ways so I can find someone who is. Mm -hmm. So speaking of vision, you mentioned a thousand agents there in, in your local market. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, but I mean, do you have a vision for, you know, the the franchises that you're selling, you know, yep. I mean, like, what does that look like, you know, 10 years, 20 years, long-term? So I can tell you where I am versus where I was when we met with you, where I was when we met with you is we weren't all the way out of production, mostly 90%. 
Um, we're heavy on recruiting and training brand new agents, low producing agents. Now where my trajectory is and what I solely work on is finding other partnerships who want to be like us and solely focus on uh, coaching with them, helping them grow. Because ideally, I would like to have 25 offices within the next two years that are all scaled to the level that we are so we can work together and keep pushing it in the same direction. So 25 offices, two years to get to a point where they have 100 plus agents and they're kicking ass. So yeah, that's exactly right. Yep. Yep. Awesome stuff, man. Well, well just, just one last time. Well, we got the calendar link that you guys are going to share below. Yes. Yep. Um, if people want to follow you guys, social media or I- any of that stuff, I mean, are there places for people to do that as well? Yeah. If Facebook, um, and then we're, we're beefing up our Instagram. We're going to be pushing out a lot of content as well. Um, so just, uh, we'll share with you our Instagram links and stuff like that, okay. but look us up on Facebook too. follow our brokerage as well. If you want some inspiration on like how we're kind of marketing the things out we're doing. Um, first class. Real I think estate we should give KC. them access to our uh, private group page too, to where we really help push out market our company in our local area. I yeah. think it'll give you a good inspiration. So yeah. definitely oh, yeah. feel free to do that. Private message always works the best, and mm-hmm. we'll go from there. Awesome. Right, well, anybody that's watching and listening, if you just scroll below where whatever platform that you're at, whether it's the description or the show notes, I'll have all that information, all those links below. And Ryan and David, man, truly appreciate you guys taking time out of busy to be here. Dude, this has been freaking awesome. Absolutely, Josh. Love it, man. Can't wait to meet up next year and tell you how we're just freaking going bananas with yeah. business and everything. Yeah, else. I can't so. wait. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Appreciate well, those it, Josh. Watching, yeah, 100 percent my friend. And those watching those lit and listening, as always, truly appreciate your sport. Truly appreciate you being here. Keep crushing, keep kicking ass, and we will see you next time. Peace.